Kingswood Online. We are so thankful to be in the house of the Lord this morning, aren't we? I got to be honest with you guys, after taking some time off, it's so refreshing to be back. And they say that, you know, absence makes the heart grow fonder, and that is so true. After taking last semester to focus on studies and, and get my heart right, I'm just so excited to be back up here to worship our Father this morning. So can we just pray before we get into worship uh, for this week, uh, for all of you, that as it's the second week of class and we're doing, we're getting into the routine of things, but we're also doing holiness emphasis, that we just, uh, we just have our hearts right in this week. Would you stand with me as I pray? We're so thankful. We're so thankful to be here today. That we don't have to hide our faith. That we're able to openly express how we love you and how we feel about you. Jesus, we're so thankful that because of your sacrifice, we have access to your Holy Spirit. And that through him, we have access to heavenly gifts. As we dive into this emphasis week on your Holy God, we ask that you prepare our hearts for the message that you have in store, God. We know that your presence is already here, and we ask for more of it, God. Holy Spirit, we ask for you to flow through here like a river, touching each and every one of us in a fresh way. Lord, again, I just can't express how thankful we are to be here. We love you so much. Thank you for your sacrifice. Thank you for being Lord of our lives and guiding us each day. We pray all these things in the beautiful name of Jesus Christ. And all God's people said.
This is what heaven sounds like. We praise you, we praise you. This is what heaven looks like. This is what freedom feels like. This is what heaven sounds like. We praise you, we praise you. This is what heaven looks like. This is what freedom feels like. This is what heaven sounds like. We praise you, we praise you. Make 
maker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are, you are, way maker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are, that is who you are. And never present open times of trouble. You've been faithful. Yeah. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. And never stop, never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're again. You never stop. You never stop working. 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 You are way maker, miracle worker, promise keeper. Light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. You are way maker, miracle worker, promise keeper. Light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. You are way maker, way maker, miracle worker, promise keeper. Light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. Waymaker, waymaker, miracle worker, promise keeper. Light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. 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 We make a miracle worker, promise keep it. Light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. We make a miracle worker, promise keep light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are.
king. I am a tree bending beneath the weight of his wind and mercy. When all of a sudden I am unaware of these afflictions eclipsed by glory, and I realize just how beautiful you are and how great your affections are for me. And oh, how he loves us so. Oh, how he loves us. How he loves us so. And oh,
So heaven me stirred like a sloppy wind Kiss and my heart turns violently inside of my chest And I don't have time to maintain these regrets When I think about the way that he loves us Oh, how he loves us Oh, how he loves us Oh, how he loves That he loves us Oh, how he loves us Oh, how he loves us Oh, how he loves thank you that we are able to come together as one and to worship you and to glorify your name. God, let this service be a fragrant offering for you. God, I pray as Dr. Deneth comes and speaks for these next couple services that you use him as a vessel and that you open our hearts and you open our ears so that we can listen. And God, give us a hint into what we're going to be listening to. God, you are so good. And what a privilege it is to glorify you and to worship you. We lift this up in your holy, beautiful name. Amen. You may be seated. oil of faith kept in heaven for you who are even now being saved by the power of God. That's the greeting of 1 Peter, the first few verses, and that's the greeting that I come to you. I was in a different place just a little while ago, and then I got on a plane to come here, and I had a little bit of time with the Lord, and this is what I heard him say. You don't go with eloquence or wisdom you go with humility, fear, and trembling in order that the power of God would be evident while you were there. 
So everything does not rest on your ability to communicate anything. It rests on the Spirit of God and the power of God. Is that true? Well, now, you're a quiet group. I heard that while you were singing, or should I say, I didn't hear while you were singing. So, is that true, church? Thank you, thank you. I want to speak this morning on the subject of discipleship. I want to speak tonight, and I, that is this morning, I want to, ooh, I bet there are boundaries here, brother. I mean, how far can I go? Because I was thinking about Romans. I can go? Okay. Uh, I, I want to speak on what it is, the call to follow God into something. And then tonight, I want to speak on the call to follow a cause. This morning, to follow a person. Tonight, to follow a cause. The call to follow Jesus is a call to enlist in the things Jesus is doing. He has an agenda. And then tomorrow morning, if I can, I'll try to speak on the call into hard things, into things that you're not passionate about, but you know you are supposed to do them. So shall we start at the very beginning? At the beginning of every Christian's life is a call to follow Jesus. Inherent in that call to follow him is a call to believe. For God so loved the world that he sent his only son that whoever in him should not perish but have eternal life towards the beginning of John chapter 3 verse 16. At the end of John we read in chapter 20 verse 31, I have written all of these things that you might believe and that by believing you might have life in his name. And so core to the gospel what it means to be a Christian is the call to believe in Christ. So, let's start with the first question. I have two others. How many of you this morning can say, I believe in Jesus? I see your hand. Oh, good. This is going to be an easy morning. Sometimes I'm in groups where that everybody would raise their hand. So, just, But wait, what does that mean? To believe in Jesus. When Jesus came preaching, he said, repent and believe the gospel. So what does it mean to believe? When a fellow named Jairus brought his daughter to Jesus or wanted to, he got word that before Jesus could get there, she died. Jesus turns and says to the synagogue leader, don't be afraid. Just believe. What does that mean? When Jesus told the parable of the sower, he said, this seed represents those who believe and then fall away. So apparently, belief is not something static, like you got it and you, it's just yours. It might be fluid then. Am I, are you tracking? It, this needs to be dialogic. Is this making sense? So apparently it, it moves a little bit. You can believe something and then it can fall away. When Jesus meets the man in Mark chapter 9 who says, my son... Uh, is mute, he cannot speak, Jesus says, all things are possible for those who believe. And he says, I do believe, help my unbelief. So apparently, it's possible to believe something and not believe something at the same time. Are you still tracking? So, it, it, that, so you can't get into this mindset that says, I'm a Christian, that means I believe. I believe that makes me a Christian, one and done. 
Because what we're hearing already is that believing is not a static condition. It's the dynamic thing. It moves. It comes in more or less degrees. You can have it and then it slips away. Or you can have it and you can have something else at the same time. You there? So now you have to ask yourself, do I really believe? When the woman at the well, John chapter 4, she meets Jesus, he tells her everything. Remember the story? Do you remember the story? Uh, he, he, and she is overwhelmed by this. She goes home and tells her neighbors, come see a man that told me everything I ever did. This can't be, could it? Her neighbors run out to meet him. He goes back to their village and stays. And then they say to the woman, Ha! Now we believe not only because of what you said, but because we've heard him ourselves. And we know that he is the Son of God. So now there are different levels of believing. There is believing because of what somebody else told you, which is how most of us came to become Christians. And then there's believing because you've met him yourself. And in that encounter, it changed the way that you're thinking about that man. And maybe belief isn't the point. Maybe belief is only a stop on the road to knowing So maybe you could come to believe in something so well and so long that it just becomes embedded in you and you know it. You don't need to believe it. I remember three years ago sitting in an office on a good Friday. I just received word my sister was terminal and Nobody knew that. Hadn't told anyone outside the family. And I went to a Good Friday service and I sat in the corner while we performed the service to an empty auditorium so people could watch it online. And because I wasn't in it, I could just sit in the shadows and I wept the entire time. Not only because I was losing her, but because... Earlier that week, I had been in a room with him and I heard him say, I am praying for you. And that, that rattled me, you guys. Because it felt to me like my whole faith was just shaken. Have you ever been in that place? Have you ever been in that place? And then you hear his voice saying, Satan would sift you if I'd let him. But I prayed for you. And it rattled me. And I said to my wife on the phone, I said, you know what? I don't believe in Easter anymore. I know it. I don't have to believe it. I know it. Because I've been in a room with him. And that became a frame of reference for me. So that whatever happens now, I can go back to that was one of the times. There were others where I was in a room with him and I heard his voice. And it rattled me. And my faith went from belief into knowing. And so I tell myself, maybe belief is a stop on the way to knowing I've got to get to the point Jackie Lowe writes in his book, Living Faith, I read last summer, and he says there's a difference between faith and belief. Faith, he says, is a series of convictions that are rooted to things that are true. Faith is tied to doctrines. You were told things about Jesus, you believe or you have faith that those things are true. Is this making sense? And so you start to live as though those things were true. Belief, he said, is not a conviction. Belief is an encounter. 
It's a moment where He, Christ Himself, interrupts your life, disrupts your life, and reorients everything around that encounter. And that thing, He said, is underneath our faith. So there are many who have had faith cannot yet believe because they've never had an encounter with the living Christ. So when I ask this morning, do you believe in Jesus? That's what I'm asking. Have you had an encounter with the living one? I said there are two other questions. I'll give them to you. Both at once. The second question is do you believe Jesus? You say you believe in Jesus, but do you actually believe Jesus? When you actually believe Jesus, you are not just pulled into his gravitational force. You begin to believe that Jesus is right about things. And so you take a risk obeying what Jesus said to do, even though you don't think it's right. You tracking? If you believe in Jesus, He will sooner or later say things to you that are impossible. He will say that you should love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. And that sounds good until you have enemies. And then you know how ridiculous of a statement that is. He was like, love my enemies except this one. When Jesus speaks, he'll say, you should give to those who cannot pay you back. And you want to say, that is, that is not how the economy works, brother. When Jesus speaks, he will say, you should open your homes and your neighborhoods to people who are not like you. And you, that sounds good in theory until they move in and they have these weird ways about them and you hear the teaching of Jesus say, no, no, this is a chance for you to practice hospitality. And you say, this is not hard. This is impossible. And in a moment like that, you will have another decision to make. I already believe in Jesus. I've been pulled into his gravitational force. I think he is right about the claims he made about himself. He's probably right about heaven and earth. I love the idea of the kingdom of God. But now he is making some invasive things. And he's asking me, even though I don't like them, and I think he's wrong. I'll try. You there? Uh, I was talking to Tanton last night. Tanton said, tell me the story about you getting robbed. Remember that? I said, which time? There were seven. It's true. The first time I was robbed, uh, I caught the guy. He's a 16-year-old kid in the house. Come home, and he's in the back trying to go out the window. I hear the window go, I'm like, hmm, I got this dude. Ran around outside the house. He's got one leg over the window and one leg inside the little bathroom. Grab him by the shirt pull him onto the floor or onto the ground, put a knee in his back, and he's dressed like a cop. It's Halloween. And he starts reaching for a plastic gun. Like, man, hmm. Pull the kid up, bring him inside the house, sit him down. He's sitting on the couch. I call the police to say, I just got a guy, he's in my house. He's already turned everything in the bedroom upside down. And the police say, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. We know this guy. We'll be there in a few minutes. I'm standing in the room, the guy's sitting on the couch, and I say, 
sit here until the police come. And no sooner do I say it, and this kid, he just, he just goes, and he, and he goes to stand up like he's going to leave. And when he did it, I cocked. I said, I hope you do. Man, give me a reason. I will wreck you. And the kid just goes, and he sits back down. I said, good move. Police come. They take him away. They don't book him. They don't do anything because they know his daddy. But it's stored in my mind. Six months later, I come home, and he's robbed me again. And this time, I didn't catch him. But I can tell that he has backed a car into my garage and literally loaded everything in my house, everything, furniture, dishes, technology, everything. I'm already poor, and now he's taken what little I have, and it's long gone. The cops say by the time you get hold of it, he's already sold it. You'll never find it again. And you guys, my hatred for that kid just rose in degree. Thought, not only do I know who you are, but I know the stuff that you're capable of. And here's the hard part. At this point, I'm a preacher. I'm a young preacher in a small church trying to figure out how to lead a congregation poorly. And I hate this kid. I'm having visions in my head of catching him a third time in these fantasies of what I want to do. You can't get rid of them. And one day I'm on a walk and I hear this voice inside my head say, love your enemies, pray for those who persecute you. And I said what you would all say, this is ridiculous. There are enemies and then there is this. And you don't change this by loving this. And it wouldn't leave me. Pray for your enemies. So you guys, I took a chance. I not only believed in Jesus, I decided to actually believe Jesus and start to do what Jesus said to do. Even though I didn't like it, I didn't think it would work, hoped it wouldn't work, and it did. I found myself actually pitying the kid who took all my stuff. And in a strange way, he wasn't an enemy anymore. And I thought to myself, it works. Jesus is not only the Son of God, he's smart. He knows how life works. And when he says to do ludicrous things, it's because he knows what you don't know. So when you go from believing in Jesus to actually believing Jesus, you follow what he tells you to do because you know he knows more than you. You take chances. You there? There's one more. Do you believe in Jesus? Do you actually believe Jesus? Please. Do you believe what Jesus believes? The first stage, believing in Jesus, I'd call an invitation, followed by commitment. The second stage, I'd call it Imitation. I imitate what Jesus says to do because I, I think he might be right. So I imitate even though I do not feel uh, like I want to do this. It's counterintuitive. Are you tracking? But in the third stage, I would call this instinct. When, when you believe what Jesus believes, 
you do things that Jesus would do instinctively because they have become your way. So you don't have to think about it. Now it occurs to me that most of the discipleship that goes on in churches, even on campuses, is all about imitation and not about instinct. But if we get to the heart of discipleship, Jesus is actually trying to change our instincts. So our defaults are like his. Are you there? So when Jesus woke up in the morning, I don't think he asked himself, what would Jesus do? He don't, what would I do? He just did the only thing that seemed natural for him and it turned out being the right thing. He was never pretending or trying to project anything else than who he truly was. And that's instinct. And the goal of discipleship is to get hold of our instincts, our desires, the things that we want, and get past the stage of trying to suppress desires and elevate good ones, it is to actually have good desires. It is to stop trying to see the world like Jesus sees it and actually see it the way he sees it without trying. Are you, are you, I can't tell. Are you listening uh, there's a long time ago, there was a woman named Mother Teresa. Have you heard of this name? She uh, is a saint uh, in the Catholic Church, starts orphanages, infirmaries in India for the poor and the left out. And one time the Pope goes over to pay her a visit, and the Pope, he has a car, a, like it's a big Cadillac, that's delivered there. So when she's there, she can move around in this Cadillac. And, or he can, and when he decides to leave, the Pope leaves behind the Cadillac and lets Mother Teresa have it. The Pope isn't even back to the airport yet, and Teresa, <laughs> Teresa is hawking the Cadillac to sell it so, so she can give the money to the poor. Now, she is not doing this to try and be Christian. It's that her desires, her way of seeing the world, her value system about what matters and what doesn't matter is so instinctual with her, she would no sooner keep that Cadillac than you would give it away. Two quick stories in the book of Luke, and then I'm done. What time is it? All right. Two quick stories that will bring meaning to this. In the Gospel of Luke, all of the encounters with Jesus happen while they are on the way, on the road. And it turns out, it, in Luke 9, we find out it's the road that leads to the cross. So all of Jesus' life in Luke occurs while they are walking on the way. On the way, Jesus will meet everything from Samaritans to one of And all of these people that Jesus meets are interested in Jesus. It means what he's saying is fascinating. This guy is unique. His words have force. So it could be said, in a sense, that they are believing in Jesus, at least to some degree. But in Luke chapter 18, he has an encounter with a fellow that's rich. And the story changes. In Luke 18, the rich leader comes to Jesus and says, what must I do to inherit eternal life? He doesn't mean heaven. In that 
He simply means, what must I do to have the life of God? And T. Wright calls it the life of the coming age. The Jews believed that there was an age in which heaven and earth would be rejoined and all that was foul and evil would be taken away and that which was beautiful would be real again. Christians call it heaven, but for them it was the convergence of the two worlds. There was a day coming when God would be in charge of everything. And so what he's saying is, how can I have that day? And Jesus said, you know the Ten Commandments, and he lists five of them. No adultery, no murder, no stealing, no lying, and honor your parents. And the guy says, I've done these things from a childhood up. Jesus says, there's still one thing you lack. Go sell everything you have, give it to the poor. Then you will find riches in heaven. Then follow me. Sometimes we think, oh, Jesus is saying, trade up, man. Take what you have now and invest it in the kingdom of heaven. And then when you leave earth, you will go to the investment that you have made in heaven. I don't think that's what he's saying. I think he's saying, if you can see things the way I see them, you will sell and give to the poor and then heaven will enter you. It'll get here early. You'll start to live that life now, even though you're on earth. Sell what you have, give to the poor. I know it's stupid. It sounds like it would never work. But in the kingdom of God, everything is upside down. Do it, man. Do it. And the guy says, here's a guy that has decided to follow Jesus. He's decided to believe in Jesus. But he can't believe Jesus. He doesn't think he's right. Jesus is right saying you can't have what you want until you get rid of what you already have. It's the obstacle, brother. Can't you see it? No. Story ends. The following chapter, there is a man named Zacchaeus. You know, a little guy. He hears Jesus coming to town. He wants to see him, but he's a tax farmer. That means he's pledged the Roman government, I'll collect a certain number of money from this region, and then whatever more he collects, he keeps. Tax collectors loan people money, charge them interest, and they were rich, and so the Jews hated them. Like you hate terrorists. They hated tax collectors. He's curious, that's all he is, is curious. He finds out Jesus is coming into town. Climbs up in a tree with big wide leaves so he can hide. And while he's Jesus coming down, he looks up and he sees Zacchaeus. And he says, hey, come on down. I have to be in your house today. <laughs> he invites himself over. Come down, I'm coming over. Zacchaeus comes down, invites Jesus over. The Jews who hate him are horrified at this. And in the middle of that dinner conversation, Jesus, uh, Zacchaeus says to Jesus, unsolicited, all that I have, half of it, I give to the poor. And if I've cheated anybody, I'll give it over four times. Those who read the book in the original language, some of them anyway, tell us that there is no reason to read that in the future tense. Zacchaeus is not saying, someday I will give half of my possessions to the poor. He's saying, I give now half of my possessions to the poor. And if I'm cheating people, I'm already giving them four times what I owe them. And Jesus listens to this, and he says, boy, today salvation has come to this house. This man is a son of Abraham. This is a shocking story. Nowhere in the story of Zacchaeus does he bow his head, bend a knee, say a prayer, take a sacrament, make a public profession of faith. He simply says, what you're calling me to do, I'm already doing it. I not only believe in you, I actually believe the way that you believe. And Jesus says, of all places, I find a true child of Abraham in the home of a tax collector. Oh, you know where this is going, don't you? How many of you this morning 
believe in Jesus. Good. You do well. But how many of you actually believe Jesus? How many of you are willing to risk doing something that seems to you crazy just because he tells you to do it? You say, well, that's faking. No, it's not. It's believing. He knows something you don't know. And you're willing to trust something you value in what he says. How many have the nerve to do that? And then, even more, how many of you actually believe what Jesus believes? You would say, his value system is my value system. I do it because I want to. Those are my instincts. This is obedience out of love, not duty. That's my nature. You can't satisfy this sermon with a single decision today. That isn't the point. The point is to bring to your awareness, heighten your awareness, that however much you have of God and God of you, there is infinitely more when your nature has been changed. Would you bow your head, Father? To live, think, act, speak, desire, persevere as Jesus himself, extensions of Jesus himself, that is our goal. Now, wherever we are in this journey, I pray that the words we have shared this morning will stir an even greater interest, maybe light a fire, until we are in the fullness of God himself, Christ fully formed in us, in Jesus' name. Forgotten and offer them a home, adopting the unwanted and calling them your own. Make us like you, Lord. Oh, give us your heart. Oh, give us your heart. Let the light of heaven shine as we step into the dark. Oh, give us your heart, oh, give us your heart, as we see your kingdom come and death depart. Oh, give us your heart, oh, give us your heart. Those oh, are on the lowly. Though others look away, your feet are unto the broken, your hands are quick to save. Make us like you, you Lord. Oh, make us like you, Lord. Oh, give us your heart. Oh, give us your heart. Let the light of heaven shine as we step into the dark. Oh, give us your heart. Oh, give us your heart. All to see your kingdom come and death depart. Oh, give us your heart. 
Oh, give us your heart. I'll invite you to stand as we continue singing. Let justice flow like a river in the desert. Let the nations know that you will reign forever as the earth beholds the glory of the Savior. Let justice flow. Let justice flow. Like a river in the desert, let the nations know that you reign forever as the earth beholds. The glory of the Savior, let justice flow. Oh, give us your heart. Oh, give us your heart. Let the light of heaven shine as we step into the dark. Oh, give us your heart. Oh, give us your heart. All to see your kingdom come and death depart. Oh, give us your heart. Oh, give us your heart. Oh, give us your heart And let justice flow Like a river in the desert Let the nations know That you reign forever As the earth be home the glory of the Savior, let justice flow. And oh, give us your heart, oh, give us your heart. Let the light of heaven shine as we step into the dark. Oh, give us your heart, oh, give us your heart. Or to see the kingdom come and death depart. Oh, give us your heart. Give us your heart. for the beauty of who you are. Thank you for not just giving us something to believe in, but something to know, and thank you for giving us the opportunity to know you. Thank you for being there with us on the mountaintops, and thank you for walking with us through the valleys. And I pray that as we gather here and as we continue in these services and sing songs like this. Let it not just be pretty melodies, but let us be the cry of our hearts. I pray that when we sing, I pray that when I sing, give me your heart. I truly mean it, and it's not just something to fill the space.
Jesus, I've seen too much of your faithfulness to not believe that you'll carry us through the lowest of the lows. And I pray that as we walk out of here, we leave changed after an encounter with you. And every encounter with you, I pray that we continue to be renewed and continue to leave your presence changed. Thank you for the opportunity that you give us to know you, to have this relationship with you. And I pray for all of us as we go and continue about our day that we would just keep you at the center of everything we do and everything we say and every thought we think. And I thank you for your beauty and I thank you for your love. And I pray this in the beautiful name of Jesus.